Thank you. You're all very welcome here. The grand hotel. My name is James O'Sullivan. Some of you know me, some of you don't. I worked with a few lads and here I see a lot of space. And that's much more of your brother I know that. And a few other water and not the three men of water group as well. And um, we have we set up an iron set up the uh, three men move, uh, movement uh, last December in the Jeff's home and we had six iron workers that day that night. Six of us sat down, we had a chat and basically we, we talked about what was going on in the country, what was going on in the world and, and uh, pretty, pretty much agreed that everything was upside down and inside out and very worried about what's going on in the future of the country. So we decided to set up the, the movement and uh, set up the Facebook page shortly after that. We have arranged two meetings, have meetings every month since then. It's um, very well and recently I uh, launched the freemanofwarper.com website and I'd like to be able to have a look at that when you get a chance in the future. And on that there is ways to help people who are in serious crisis with debt. Okay, they're being worried by government agents and uh, seeing one they don't block they have to pay and also information about all different aspects of being free. And uh, I think that's why everyone is here tonight because they want to learn a little bit more about what it means to be truly free. And um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to Ian. And thanks all, thanks that all for being here tonight. I hope you learn and open your mind and I'll pass to uh, the world of being able to pass on to you guys tonight. Thanks very much. Good evening. Are you hearing me okay, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well, thanks for coming along this evening. This was supposed to be my night off. I've just done um, the 11 days over the last 12 days. Uh, I've popped up, um, I think, 1,500 miles. I've seen in more of Ireland than I've ever seen before. It's fantastic. Uh, it's been a great uh, tour. In fact, I've circled the country twice in that time. So this is going to be the original day off, and I was... Uh, I, book to thank you today and stay at a hotel in glory and I just literally got off the phone with the hotel and I got a call from James and he said well any possibility you could give a talk in Wilson and of course I looked at the map and I thought I'm in Chronicle the night before I can do Wilson so <laughs> anyway, I'll get up to uh, glory at some ungodly hour of the morning. It's wonderful to be here and it's wonderful to see so many people and I have to say I think this is probably the youngest average age that I've seen at any of the talks I've given, the average age has probably been the high time of 40 over the course of the last few weeks, and it's great to have a rough calculation to see that this is all the average age you want to see tonight, probably the other side of 40, which is great. Because what I'm going to share with you this evening is aimed at the young generation. I mean, I don't think what's going on really, to the greater extent, it aims so much at the, uh, the people in their 50s, 60s, 70s. It aims much more at uh, the younger generation. And you know, the challenges I've been throwing down to the, uh, the poor people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s is basically, you know, we have fallen into a trap. We've been baited into a trap. And we fell for it hook, line, and sinker. And Ireland is not being singled out here, and I'm sure you realize. Uh, because Spain is in much the same situation as in Portugal, Greece is a complete basket case, Italy is not far behind Spain, and the UK is really not far behind that, despite you know, what the media may try to lead everyone to believe. But the real challenge is, what is the legacy that we're going to leave the next generation? And what legacy are we going to leave the children and the grandchildren? Because as I'm going to show you through the course evening, if we do nothing, actually it doesn't bear thinking about. It really doesn't bear thinking about. And what the media is doing is we're trying to, uh, to master this. And you know, the media also keeps us in distraction. And you know, the last few weeks have been a classic illustration of that. I mean, it, you know, the past year has really been amazing in, in many respects, probably starting with the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster on April 20th last year. Uh, and then you know, with events this year, probably kicking off on what, March the 11th with the uh, uh, the earthquake, the tsunami, the meltdown of the Fukushima power plant, of which there is way more to that story that, that has been reported in the media. But um, <coughs> unfortunately, we don't have time to get into all of that tonight. And then more recently, of course, in the in the US, not that anybody really gave a damn, but uh, outside the US, but inside the US, the birth of the Obama was a big issue. 
And of course, you know, it's, um, I don't think there's much truth in the rumour that he was actually in Ireland looking for his birth certificate. <laughs> but having said that, he certainly hasn't found it in the US. Somehow this guy has managed to conceal his true origins. He still managed to conceal his true origins uh, for the last five years that, that he's been on the presidential campaign trail and, of course, in the White House. And this is really quite remarkable. And this really came before a few weeks ago when Donald Trump, who had thrown his hat into the ring and said that he was seriously considering running for president in the 2012 presidential campaign, and he had a bit between his teeth and he wasn't going to let this drop. So, obviously, somebody in the White House said, you know, we're going to have to shut this guy up. We're going to have to produce a birth certificate. again. Well, this was obviously something that was so, so, so important. They couldn't give this to a young intern i.e. somebody who would really know how to do a good Photoshop job. So they gave it to somebody who obviously they trusted, who'd probably been around for about 30 odd years or so. The only problem was that whoever that they gave it to just didn't really know the intricacies of using Photoshop. So when the first syndicate was published, on the White House website, I mean this is not a conspiracy website, it was on the White House website, it took people who uh, knew graphics packages like Photoshop, about two and a half nanoseconds to realise that it was indeed a portrait. Because it was in nine layers. Nine layers. Meanwhile, on the night that it was posted, Obama was actually doing a, a little bit of a stand-up routine, probably with his telephones we won't say, but he was doing a bit of a stand-up routine and, at a fundraiser, and Donald Trump was in the audience. And Obama actually referred to the birth certificate and the fact that it had been posted that night. And he said, well, you know, this at least puts the birth certificate issue to bed and shuts up the birthers, which is what they're, they're, called, they're known as in the US. He said, now Donald Trump will have to focus on some real issues. And this is really what Obama said. He said, the, the real issues that Trump's going to have to focus on now are whether America really did put a man on the moon and whether aliens really did crash at Roswell in 1987. <laughs> well, his attempt at humour came back to bite him in the butt, of course, because by the following day, it was very obvious that the birth of the issue not only had it not gone away, it had now got new life. So over that weekend, that was the last Friday in April, over the weekend, obviously the White House PR machine went into overdrive, because now they have to come up with something that was so enormous that it would completely take the whole of the birth certificate issue off the front pages of the American media. And they wrapped their brains, obviously, for you know, 24 hours, and then in the next 24 hours, they hatched their scheme. And of course, their scheme was to assassinate the son of Islam and kill him for what is at least the third time. And you know, there are many people who worked with, in the George Bush government in 2001 who are absolutely convinced that uh, some of them are dead before the end of 2001. And then in 2007, November 2007, Ben Bunto was giving an uh, interview with David Frost. And in that interview, she actually said that Omar Sheikh had murdered Osama Bin Laden. And David Cross just let it go straight over his head. He didn't challenge her on it at all. And it was later suggested that she uh, made a trip of the tongue, and what she really meant to say was that Omar Sheikh had murdered Daniel Pearl, the journalist, which he certainly is uh, believed to have done. But having said that, Benazir Bruto was a very experienced politician, and she certainly wasn't renowned to make a trip to the tongue. And, and of course, we can't ask her to explain because several weeks after giving that interview, she herself was assassinated. So the Osama bin Laden issue, I mean, if we look at what occurred here, supposedly Obama and his team were watching the live feed from the Navy SEALs, and they were sitting around the table watching it on their computers, and of course later we learned that the live feed remarkably cut out just as the Navy SEALs were about to break through the walls of this luxury villa in uh, Abbottabad in, in Pakistan. And then, of course, the stories start to come out, you know, one story says that Osama bin Laden was shot in the compound, then he was captured, taken outside the compound, assassinated, first he was, you know, in his underwear, then he wasn't, then his wife stood in front of him and took a bullet for him, then she didn't, 
And of course, like any lie, like any lie, and Daniel Esterly is about to find out, oh, I'm sorry, that's the sort of fun. Daniel Esterly has got a bit of a problem with Daniel Esterly and his story, by the way, about being arrested coming out of Spain, but I'll say that for later. <laughs> when you tell a lie, and that lie is probed, then you have to tell more lies to cover up the holes in the first lie. And then when, you, when the holes in the second lie are uncovered, you tell more and more and more lies. And that's why you know, the American media were literally running wild with this story. And once again, the US government was in panic mode. Because now they needed something to get the Osama bin Laden issue off of the front pages. Now, having said that, these two events have a phenomenal effect on the US public. Because more and more people turned away from the mainstream media and started to look at the alternative media for their news. <coughs> But now we needed something massive again to take the Osama bin Laden issue away from the front pages. Plus, of course, plus America was about to burst through its self-imposed debt ceiling of $14.3 trillion. Therefore, America was about to effectively go into bankruptcy in exactly the same way as, allegedly, Ireland did at the um, back end of last year. So the headline, the headline on Monday week ago should have been America bankrupt, IMF called in. But something remarkable happened that day and Dominic South Khan was arrested on a plane trying to apparently uh, get away from the US before anybody found out what he may or may not have been doing with a Ghanaian maid in the stock hotel in New York. Now I have no idea what the truth is here, of course. This is going to untold over the coming weeks and months. What we do know, and you know, what I have heard right from the outset when this news first broke, is that this guy is a serial sexual predator. And that would be given, because let me tell you from my days in the oil industry, whenever we had a situation where somebody was effectively accused of sexual harassment, it was never, ever the first time. And once you start an investigation, unfortunately, you know, other cases would always come out of the woodwork. So it's pretty much a given that this guy had a history, and of course that history is now coming to the fore, and, and that is ultimately what I've um, uh, what been down for. And ironically, ironically, two weeks ago, well, three weeks ago now, three weeks ago, he made the observation in an interview with Liberation in France, that he could quite foresee a situation where he was set up and somebody was paid between 500,000 and a million euros to accuse him of rape. I mean, remarkably prescient observation. On the other hand, of course, you know, at some level of consciousness, he would have to acknowledge his own behaviour and, of course, uh, realise that he was pretty much an easy candidate to set up. So if he was set up, if he was set up, and I have to say, I'm not going to rule that out because it is an incredible coincidence that he gets nailed on the day that America goes bankrupt. I mean, that is just, you know, almost too much of a coincidence. So I certainly wouldn't rule out the possibility that there is some kind of uh, set up here. I mean, there's a very good possibility that he had a record of, uh, you know, trying to, um, and get it on with uh, the mate in the hotel and you know, maybe they knew that this was his standard behaviour and so of course he was pretty easy to, to set up and bring down. Well, how the mighty fall? I love this, this is from the Irish Daily Mail uh, back in the last week, a week ago. The $10 million dollar man. You know, this is basically what his family set up and his bail conditions are really quite incredible because the bail conditions not only include having to wear an electronic tag, but the bail conditions and the food in having to live in an apartment which has CCTV on all the uh, entrances and exits and he has to pay for private security guards to monitor his movement. But this is what's incredible as well, he actually has to live with his wife. The judge ruled that you have to live with your wife. Well, I, mean, I think if I had been caught doing something like this, and the judge said you have to live with your wife, I'd go, please put me back in jail. <laughs> 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 he's really up uh, for him here. 
Well, you know, of course, there's somebody else who is also um, <laughs> celebrating big time that um, come across us, and that is uh, Tarkovi, because Dominic Strauss Khan has pretty much announced that he was going to run against Tarkovi in next year's French presidential election, and the media were making the case that he was basically going to be a shoo So Tarkovi, who clearly knew of Strauss Khan's penchant, for being a sexual predator, because effectively it's on record that uh, Sarkozy warned Strauss Khan when he took up the job with the IMF and, and uh, was going to be based in Washington, he warned Strauss Khan that he would not be able to get away with the same type of behaviour in the state as he had become accustomed to getting away with in France. So once again, you know, I wouldn't completely rule out uh, Sarkozy or Sarkozy supporters having a hand in Strauss Khan's uh, downfall. So, consequently, you know, there's a number of people here. At the very least, there's the Federal Reserve, the US Federal Reserve, and Sarkozy supporters, who are not necessarily on the same team, but um, you know, they would certainly have uh, wanted to see this guy dragged down. So here's a, an extract from uh, um, a news article written by a US reporter, really quite cracked, but at the same time quite poignant. Strauss Khan is the mastermind of the IMF plan to impose a global federal reserve system on the nations of the world. Now this is where he was effectively not on the same team as the US federal reserve, because the US federal reserve wants to effectively take control of global financing. But the IMF, of course, actually has the mandate for that. So, you know, and once again, it's not a love loss between the US Federal Reserve and the IMF. So you have got to say, plan, impose, plan to impose the global Federal Reserve system on nations of the world and wage war on those that, like Libya, refuse. In that context, the absence of morality requires foreign rates to sodomize the host army. It may seem like a foregone conclusion. That's big analogy, perhaps, but uh, <coughs> There's no question. The designed who are sort of, if you like, become accustomed to operating at this kind of level, unfortunately seem to adopt um, you know, a very arrogant persona that effectively enables them to believe that they can literally treat anyone with their shuttle. That's an example. It's from Mary Anderson in the um, Irish Daily Mail last week. An EU liar, a grim IMS sex scandal, and a very troubling question as to who runs our country. Well, I don't know where Mary Ellen has been over the last six months, but there ain't no doubt as to who's running Ireland. And it's been spelled out in words of one syllable in the Irish media. And this is very, very important to those who think they are the rightful rulers of a planetary kingdom. Because in their deep occult belief system, they actually believe that they have to tell us what they are doing and what they're planning to do so that when we don't react, when we just carry on with our mundane lives, they take it as a mandate to pursue their agenda. And in the second half of the evening, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of headlines from front pages in the Irish media. And the second one of these headlines the Eurocrats in Brussels knew this headline was going to appear on the front page of the Irish Daily Mail, and they actually were hanging their sort of, you know, hooks because they weren't absolutely sure that they were going to get away with it. This was the moment of truth, the moment at which either the Irish people reasserted their claim for Irish sovereignty, or they just acquiesced and effectively became an EU colony. Well, unfortunately, you know what the answer of that was. But I'll show you how it is spelled out in very clear form so that you know, nobody can deny that we haven't actually been told what's going on. So what's occurring right now, of course, is they've effectively got the mandate, so we're starting to see the symptoms. Now, the good news is, of course, as the symptoms start to really take hold and fight, you know, we saw an article, I think it was either yesterday, I saw it online, I'm not sure whether it was yesterday or today's um, examiner, which talks about 600,000 people in this country 
um, being in, in poverty, you know, or close on 14% of the population. You know, for a nation that's part of the developed world, is an enormous percentage. In the manifestation of uh, this agenda, the massacre on Main Street, sky high rents and rates killing off our city centres. Well, you know, something's not right here. Because normally, normally, when there is a recession or depression, the money starts to dry up, you know, businesses go bust. People don't have income, then there's less money being spent on the high street. So normally, the landlords of, of shops and offices realize that there's less money around, and so they lower the rent, because they know that their tenants can't afford to pay high rent. But something's not right with what's going on, because the rents are being pushed up. So it's almost like there is a deliberate agenda here to decimate the high street and to kill off the independent traders. And when we understand what's going on, it all fits into place. Because what is going on here is a game of global monopoly. And just like the board game monopoly, everybody here plays monopoly at some time, yeah? Yeah. Please have an idea of how the game works. The game works with all the locations on the board, and the game starts with everybody buying up the, the various locations, but then you need a full set. So you barter, you trade to get your full set. And then you start to build houses and hotels. And then once everybody on the, in the game has got a few houses and hotels on their various properties, then the real game starts. And the nature of the game is to destroy your opponents, to wipe out your opponents, to take complete control of the board. And if you're a banker, when you play Monopoly, you've got a little bit of an advantage, haven't you? You know, when you go past go, if you're a bit short of cash, you might slip yourself an extra couple of hundred. Well, the same is real deal. You know, here, they can just add a couple of notes to a, a spreadsheet and give themselves a bit more money. So, what's going on is a game of global Monopoly, and as we'll see how this unfolds, the nature of the beast is literally to wipe out the entrepreneur. Now, it's a case of four tons, because, you know, what we'll see in the media is, yeah, we need to stimulate the economy, we need to encourage the banks to lend more money, to get businesses to uh, start up and, you know, provide employment, but it's really ultimately all a charade. Because the nature of the beast, the nature of the game, is to reduce the number of people in the economy, and then literally make sure that all those people who are left are good economic players and will do what they're told because that's the only way they can keep a roof over their head and food on the table. What we've got here in Ireland is these are all the stores and these are not, you know, one off. These are chain stores. But these are all the chain stores that have basically said, you know what, we can no longer afford to operate here in Ireland because the rent on the stores is not just too high. So these are the chains that have effectively announced they're moving out and these are the ones that are apparently still in negotiation. Now every now and again, <coughs> every now and again, somebody comes into politics who actually realises what's going on, knows they can't do anything about it, but actually wants to leave a legacy so that maybe somebody in the future you know, can heed their warning. Because what's occurring here is an agenda that's in Europe and it's 402 years old. I mean, we can absolutely trace the moment that this agenda kicked off in Europe to 1609 with the implementation of fractional reserve banking at the time in Amsterdam. But that was the arrival of fractional reserve banking in Europe. Now, the reason that the bankers did get it all their own way was because, fortunately, through history, there have always been politicians who've seen what's going on, and actually had the balls to stop it. And as the banks have come up against this opposition, time and time again, <coughs> they've become increasingly, how should I say, brilliant in their strategy to make sure that they actually bring all of the prospective players into the fold, so they can manipulate any opponent to actually do their will. And one of those 
politicians that try to leave his legacy or leave for us a legacy so that we might actually pick up on it and uh, understand what's occurred with Woodrow Wilson. Now Woodrow Wilson was the President of the United States in 1913 when the bankers led by J.P. Morgan, the Rockefellers, and, um, and somebody who you probably haven't heard of, a very, very influential player, a guy called August Belmont, had their meeting on Jekyll Island, and from that meeting came the foundation of what we know today as the Federal Reserve Act. And they effectively forced Woodrow Wilson to sign the Federal Reserve Act into law, thereby giving the bank total control of the money supply in the U.S. economy. Now this is actually the third time the banks have tried to do this. So what we have today is the, this is the third Federal Reserve. The previous two have failed because politicians realized what was going on and shut them down. Woodrow Wilson's the So after signing the Federal Reserve Act into law in 1913, he made this observation in diary. He said we have become one of the worst rules one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the world, no longer a government of free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of small groups of dominant men. Now when he wrote that, there was probably no more than a handful of countries in the world who that would apply to. Today, there's no more than a handful of countries in the world who that doesn't apply to. And all the countries that it doesn't apply to are the ones that are demonized as an axis of evil. Because all the countries that are part of the axis of evil, Venezuela, Cuba, Libya, or Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Syria, they all have one thing in common. They are free of debt from the World Bank, free of debt. And that's exactly why they went after Saddam Hussein in 2003, and why they've gone after Gaddafi, and I'll talk, I'll talk more about that in a second, because the strategy for going after Gaddafi was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But let me explain how fractional reserve banking works. Now, I'm going to give you literally the three minute explanation of fractional reserve banking. But let me tell you, after this three minutes, you will know more about fractional reserve banking than anybody working the front counters in any of your banks. Because if you go into your bank and ask them to explain fractional reserve banking, they're going to go, what? They're going to have no clue. Even people who work as managers in many of our branches today have no clue about fractional reserve banking or where the money that they are lending actually comes from. So let's think about how this works. Because it's a scam. It's a brilliant scam. I mean, if any one of us tried to do it as a private citizen, we'd be arrested and, yeah, rightly, convicted and thrown in jail for a long time. But once you have either a presidential act or an act of parliament, and you are effectively given the power to establish a central bank, then the world's your oyster. And that's, of course, exactly what occurred in 1913, when Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act into the law. So, and this is how it works all around the rest of the world now, okay? And I'm going to show you here how brilliant these guys were at getting countries into debt. So, all we need is the Presidential Act to sign a central bank into being. And now, we've got the opportunity to introduce fractional reserve banking. Now, fractional reserve banking is quite mystical. In fact, it's even more mystical than alchemy. Because with alchemy, you actually need base metal, like lead, to be able to start the process of turning it into gold. But with fractional reserve banking, you don't actually need anything at all. All you need is a ledger and a pen in 1913, or today, a computer and spreadsheet. For the purposes of the illustration, we're going to assume that we do have some nominal assets. We don't actually need to, but we'll assume that we do. So we're actually going to award ourselves a million dollars. And we can do that simply by striking it on a ledger or punching the number onto a spreadsheet. But we can't do much with a million dollars. We can't really kickstart the economy with a million dollars. So we need to give ourselves a bit more money. So we're going to use a fractional reserve ratio of 5 to 1. 
So if we're going to multiply that one million by five, and we're going to give ourselves five million. But even that's not really enough to keep our economy, so we're going to get some help. So we're going to encourage some of our friends in the brotherhood to set up regional banks, investment banks, and then high street banks. And now what we're going to do is we're going to pump this five million into each of these banks. So we're going to give them a million each. But these banks are going to be a little bit more aggressive in their fractional reserve ratio. And they're going to use the fractional reserve ratio of 10 to 1. So these banks that have taken their 1 million, and all that 1 million that didn't really exist in the first place, but they're going to take that 1 million and they're going to convert it to 10 million. And the same now with the high street banks. They're going to take their 1 million and convert it to 10. And these banks are also now going to lend some of this money down into these banks. And these banks are also going to use the fractional reserve ratio of 10 to 1. So what we've got from our one million, which didn't really exist in the first place, we've now managed to reach the point where we've got at least 70 million to start playing with at the high street level. Now when it gets really clever, or outrageous depending on where you sit, is when these banks lend one million of this back to this bank, they then multiply it by 10, giving themselves, you know, a whole bunch more money, and they send it back to this bank, and then so on and so forth. So in other words, it is literally a license to print as much money as you want. Now the thing is, the central bank has the responsibility for controlling how much money is in the economy. So what the central bank can do is it can tell these banks to open the floodgates, like they did here in 2003, and throw money at anything, anything. It doesn't matter that you know, it can never be paid back, we'll worry about that another time. Just throw your money into the economy, because that's what creates the boom. What creates the bust is the bank stopping putting money in the economy and then starting to pull it back in. So there's less and less money there. So this is how fundamentally this is factual with their banking. Now, after the 1929 crash, which actually, of course, was the two crashes, 1929 and 1933, the 29 crash was pretty small back in Maryland, and we know it was deliberately contrived by the Federal Reserve, by the Central Bank. Milton Friedman wrote about it, a guy from Bernard Baruch, who was part of the team that set up the Central Bank, wrote about it, and um, uh, very recently, um, Bernanke, then Bernanke, actually acknowledged that the 1929 crash was deliberately manipulated. And he actually said, thanks to Milton Friedman, we all know, or everyone knows, that it was deliberately contrived, and because of that, we won't do it again. Well, he lied. Because it's exactly what they've done. So now we've got the money, now we've got the money in the bank, now we've got to pump it into the economy. And we do that, and I'll give you three examples, because we get the money into the economy, say, at government level, at corporate level, and at personal level. At government level, at government level, what you do is you encourage the government to borrow money for infrastructure projects. So you encourage the government to say, look, you know, why don't you make a name for yourself and you know, build some new motorways, or build a new tramway in something. And in the world, they do money for it. I mean, when you see all these signs on your motorway that says "Park Finance" by the EC, "Park Finance" doesn't mean a gift. "Park Finance" means the money was loaned, and this is the perception that's created. You know, it's thought, "Oh, we were gifted that money by the EU." Sorry, no, it was a loan. That's the way governments get themselves into debt or are encouraged to get themselves into debt. Businesses get into debt by creating a full spoon, and then what you do is you encourage the business to expand, to build a new factory, to buy new and build new offices, put all the equipment in there that you need, all the capital equipment, hire all the people. <laughs> hire all the people that you, you, know, you think you need for all this increased production, and then pull the work. So they're left holding the proverbial baby, but this baby is a massive debt. 
And then at the individual level, it's the mortgage. And you know what mortgage means, don't you? Yes, great. Yes, great. Once again, in faith, more dialogue than yes, great. Because once you can get people into debt, once again, you effectively own them. And if you can get people to borrow outrageous sums of money, way more than anybody in their right mind should ever really lend them, then you know you've got them nailed to life. And that's what happens here. So the central bank pumps money capital into the economy at government level, at corporate level, at the individual level. But of course it needs repayment, and it needs repayment of the capital plus interest. So the interest has to come from somewhere. And the interest actually comes from the wealth of the nation. So basically, once you establish the central bank, from that moment forward, you have effectively started the process of transferring the ownership of a nation from the people to the bank. Now generally, generally it's so microscopic that people don't notice it. And what happens is the wealth of the nation gets smaller and smaller and smaller until such time and all of the money generated through taxes and, and uh, very expensive products isn't enough to pay back the capital and the interest. In some cases, it's kind of pay back the interest. So in, in the US, for the last decade, every single cent of federal income taxes collected is not enough to pay the interest on the money that the US government owes the Federal Reserve. So that's why I think their debt is so outrageous. Because every year they have to borrow more money to pay the interest that they owe from previous years. So you start this spiral. And this is the point here of no return, because at this point here it means basically the banks are simply sucking the wealth out of the nation. And when, when the government eventually says, you know what, we've actually got no more money. There's no possibility of us getting any more money. So then the banks say, well, that's a bit unfortunate. What have you got? Well, let's start with your forests. Sell off your forests. <laughs> Sell off your nationalised industries. In fact, start selling anything and everything. You literally asset strip the country. So what you've got a situation right now is only Greece is about to be here somewhere. I mean, Ireland is depending on you know, what we incorporate on Ireland's balance sheet, we're going to look at that more in the second half of the evening. Ireland is allegedly to be here, but actually it doesn't need to be here, it could be here. But the banks are trying to obviously convince everybody, and they've got the government, unfortunately, right where they want them, but they're trying to convince everybody that essentially the country is totally bankrupt and it's only been bailed out so the country can survive. And that's what you're meant to believe, so that, you know, oh my God, the back of that data. Meanwhile, they're killing you. Let me show you an example of the World Bank doing what it does best in a country that should have enough natural resource for certainly the foreseeable future to never have to go anywhere near alone. You recognize this? Yeah. yeah. Dubai. Dubai, yeah. Yeah. We're going to be half of it. It's over here. A whole bunch of islands. Well, some of them have washed into the sea now, but a whole bunch of islands are shaped in the world. But this here, I lived in Dubai between 1991 and 1993, and the, the economy just had its oil, was making use of the oil for about 15 years when I moved there. And the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed Al Maktoum, was a very, very astute guy, I mean, considering he had no real education. And he took the oil that had been discovered off the coast of Dubai as a gift from Allah. And he certainly wasn't going to squander this gift. So even though he had no formal training in economics, he decided that basically he would use the money that came in from the oil to develop the country, but only develop it at a rate that he could afford to develop it from the revenues from the oil. So he built a few office blocks and he encouraged people to, businesses to come into Dubai to establish Dubai as a sort of business centre in the Middle East. He built the um, Dubai Dry Docks, <coughs> he built the Jebel Ali Container Port, he built an aluminium smelting farm, water desalination, and then he went to tourism, building golf courses and beach clubs and they established the airline. And little by little, little by little, the country was really taking off. I mean, 
you know, what you see today as, as the metropolis of Dubai is vastly different from when I was living there and just nearly 20 years ago. Well, then he died, and his son took over the reins of the country. And the IMF came along. Well, in fact, one of their agents, one of the front companies that they employed, came along and spoke to his son. They said, you know, your dad was a great man, wonderful man. He was a visionary. But we know, we know that you have even greater vision. We've got a proposition to put to you where you could leave your mark on the country. It would be such a mark that it could be seen from outer space. Uh, and they slapped this project on the table. And the young Maktoum and his advisors, they looked at the numbers, and now the young Maktoum, Western educated, they looked at the numbers and said, you know, this is a um, bit of a stretch, really. It's really beyond, you know, what we want to do, we really want to follow. You know, my father's uh, template and only developed the country as we can afford it, and we're doing pretty well. Well, the World Bank kept on and on and on and throwing in other projects and other incentives, and in the end, it's become. And of course, the country never actually sees the money. The money goes to the companies that the IMF and the World Bank bring in to build these projects. So the money goes to American companies like Bechtel and Kellogg Brown and Root, which is, of course, our cousin. And this is finished. All these luxury villas around here and on the front, and these, uh, you know, luxury beach clubs and hotels, you know, suites that run into thousands of dollars a night. And they just start to market them at the beginning of 2007. And by the end of 2007, they sold one or two, so the majority are not sold. And of course, then the economy, the global economy, is in meltdown. So there's no revenues coming in on this project to repay the loan. And the World Bank came along and said, oh gosh, that's unfortunate. Who could ever have known that was going to happen? <laughs> what are we going to do? Oh, you are, that's a shed load of money. What are we going to do? Oh, I know, you've got oil. How about, how about we simply take control of all your oil futures? And I think at that moment, the young Matsu must have had a muscle contraction. I think at that moment, he realised that he had been strung up by the proverbial keeper. <laughs> and he had fallen for it, hook, line and sinker. Well, he got lucky. He got lucky because his neighbour in Abu Dhabi, the Dubai is one of the seven emirates in the United Arab Emirates, but his neighbour in uh, Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Zayed, is actually the president of the country, and Zayed certainly did not want the IMF coming into the country. I mean, the last time that the World Bank and the IMF tried to nail the United Arab Emirates was with the collapse of um, uh, a bank, the BCCI, back in 1991. And the Zion effectively you know, got the World Bank and the IMF off his back by paying all the debts himself, or as much as many of the debts as he felt he could pay or should pay. So Zion didn't want the IMF anywhere near the country, so he bailed out the young man too. And I'm sure that the, you know, the terms were a lot more attractive, obviously, than the terms that were being imposed by the IMF. If you want to know more about how this works and to see this, it works in other countries, there's a book that I recommend. It's a book called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And it's written by a guy from John Perkins. And John Perkins, up until 1992, worked for an agency that was effectively fronting for the, uh, the World Bank. And Perkins was doing the kind of job I've just described here, where his job was to deliberately get leaders of developing nations, particularly developing nations that had massive amounts of resources, to get them to buy into infrastructure projects to get them into debt. And Perkins knew that if he wasn't successful in getting them into debt, then the World Bank would send in the next team. And the next team was all about destabilization and regime change through political uprising. Ring any bells? <laughs> and if that wasn't successful, the next stage of the game was to literally sabotage the aircraft or helicopter that the leader of the country flew around in and assassinate them. 
Well, Perkins, in 1992, signed down the up of this. And he was going to leave the World Bank and write a book. Now, the World Bank obviously held him in pretty high regard because they didn't put him on a plane or a helicopter and crash it. But they decided that you know, they didn't want the book written, so they made him an offer. And they said, look, we'll pay you a million dollars a year not to write a book. All you're going to do is not write the book and then turn up at various court cases around the world and act as an expert witness. So that you know, the World Bank can get these other companies into debt. Well, he did this for 10 years. But then 9 11 went down. And the moment 9 11 went down, he knew exactly where he was. And he decided that this was his line in the sand. And he wrote his book mm -hmm. Confessions of an Economic Hitman. Do you know what John Perkins is doing today? Mm -hmm. Right now, as I speak. Exactly. He is uh, working as a consultant to the Icelandic government, keeping the IMF out of Iceland. So that's how it works with countries. And now so on a global basis, we're in this massive, rapid agenda of globalization. And the individual that is credited with being the father of globalization, the guy who for certainly the last 17 years, although I would argue probably close to 25, has really been right at the forefront of driving this global agenda, literally stripping nations of their sovereignty, is by accident of birth an Irish passport holder. And as I go through the evening and I show you a quote in particular from this individual, in the speech that he gave in St. John's College Oxford last year, you will see exactly, exactly where this guy's loyalty is. Don't buy So what's been going on with globalization? And this is what Europe looked like at the end of the Second World War. Okay? Twenty-nine sovereign nations. The only two that are sovereign today are Switzerland and Norway. All the rest are swallowed under the Treaty of Lisbon. And whilst this has been going on, it's been going on elsewhere in the world. So we have the League of African Nations, the League of um, Arab Nations, the Pacific Economic Community, and the Southeast Asia Economic Community. Now one of the reasons, or probably the primary reason, that Gaddafi had to be nailed was because he was in the process of uniting the League of Arab Nations and the League of Arab uh, African Nations and was actually looking to introduce a gold standard. He was proposing that all Libyan oil be sold in gold and he was looking to establish the gold dinar as the currency of the League of Arab and the League of African Nations. The reason that Saddam Hussein was taken out was because in November of 2000, he announced to the world, once George W. Bush had been given the U.S. presidency by the Supreme Court, Saddam Hussein, who obviously you know, had a bit of a problem with the Bush family after the First Gulf War, so once George W. Bush was appointed president by the Supreme Court, Saddam Hussein announced that from that point forward, all Iraqi oil would be sold in Europe and not in the petro dollars, which he did until such time as the invasion in 2003. And do you remember, do you remember that George W. Bush swooped in on a plane, landed on the deck of the USS uh, Lincoln, Lincoln yeah. and right behind him was a big banner that said, Mission Accomplished. Yeah? yeah sure. And everybody thought, well, that's Mission Accomplished. That was due to the fact that the US military had reached Baghdad. That Mission Accomplished had nothing at all to do with the military campaign. That Mission Accomplished was a statement to the global financial community that from that moment forward, Iraqi oil was once again being traded in petrodollars. In the less than three years, what is it? It was, um, well, actually, it was three, just over three and a half years. In the three and a half years, the Sudan was trading oil in euros, and he only allowed, he was restricted in the amount of oil he could trade by the food to the old food program. But nonetheless, the dollar fell by over 20% against the euro in that period. The moment the US started trading Iraqi oil again in petrodollars, then the dollar recovered against the euro. The primary target here in Libya was obviously to shut down the possibility 
Olki Dati effectively becoming the senior player in the League of Arab League of African Nations and establishing an Arab African economy based on gold rather than on petrodollar. But this, the strategy was brilliant because back in 19, 2003, when Tony Blair and George W. Bush let it be known that they were effectively going to invade Iraq on the pretense of weapons of mass destruction and initiate regime change, millions of people all over the world hit the streets in protest. How many people hit the streets in protest about the invasion, well, pseudo invasion of Iraq, of uh, Libya? Hardly anybody. Because what they've done is they created the Arab Spring uprising in Egypt, Yemen, Morocco, Tunisia, Lubin, Algeria. They took the opportunity to change out some of the leaders that were in there and put in their own puppets. I mean, Mubarak was getting a little bit old, you know, he wasn't dated. wasn't going to last much longer. Great opportunity for the World Bank and its manipulators to put in their chosen leader. And by the time they went to Libya, which is that sixth in line, everybody had become accustomed to the Arab uprising, and so nobody turned their hair when they started dumping, literally, hundreds of tons of depleted uranium on Libya. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, again, Gaddafi was the level of death box. Now, I'm, not, I'm certainly not condoning a reaction of Gaddafi any more than I condone any action of any Western leader. But what's going on in Libya right now is totally contrived by the global banking community and the globalists who are trying to set up their one world corporation. That's what the New World Order is all about. It's a one world corporation, Earth PLC. The next day of the game, the legislation has been in place in Canada, the US, and Mexico since October of 2005 to establish the North American Union. Now, there's a nice schedule on this because this is supposed to be established already. The original goal was to have this in place and then merge the North American Union with the European Union by 2015. But like I said, they're behind the schedule because they haven't even managed to achieve this yet, although you know, now that the US has burst through the $14.3 trillion debt ceiling, which may be the opportunity they need to crash the US dollar and introduce the Amero across these three countries. Funded, or from a think tank, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, the document called Global Governance 2025. We know from that document that the revised goal to merge the North American Union with the European Union is 2022, unless the opportunity presents itself to do it sooner. And once they merge these two, obviously they'll have the Amero and the Euro, similar enough to merge them under one name. Once they merge them, they will rename it as the North Atlantic Union. The North Atlantic Union. And the whole idea here is to have an economic and military union that can face off China. That's how these guys work. You know, these guys work on the basis of multi-generational agendas. You know, they think 50, 100, 200 years in their agendas. And they work on the basis of the vast majority of people. They keep those locked in to very short-term thinking. Maybe you know, the next salary check, or the next sports match, or the next edition of their favourite soap, or X Factor, or Strictly Come Dancing, or Jedward, or whatever. But <laughs> keep them locked in to the bullshit minutiae. You know, I mean, there was uh, George Carney who said, you know, those who don't watch TV, and those who don't read the newspapers know a damn sight more than those who do. <laughs> That's very true. So we merge here, and then the next day is to merge all the other economic unions under the banner of the United Nations, at which point they have to rename the United Nations, because in the US, everybody thinks that the United Nations doesn't apply to them. They think the United Nations apply to everyone else. There's, there's a beautiful clip of somebody reposting on my Facebook page, if anybody goes on my Facebook page. And it's a, an Australian TV crew going around the US testing the world knowledge of the Americans. 
And, and I've got to say, I mean, in the course of my time in uh, the oil industry, yeah, there are some, there are indeed some very, very smart Americans. But they're all saying, anyway, right. <laughs> Any Americans? <laughs> well, you're very smart ones here, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is the logo of the World Bank. Very aggressive, ugly looking logo. And the World Bank has two headsmen the World Trade Organization. This is the uh, successor to uh, GATT, the General Agreement on Trade Tariffs, and the founding Director General of the World Trade Organization was the father of globalization, the guy who is known as the father of globalization, the guy who carried an Irish passport. The World Trade Organization has nothing at all to do with trade. It's about monopoly. It's effectively about slowly destroying the small businesses, the entrepreneurs, and bring them in all under the one banner. It's a long-term agenda. You're not going to see this happen over you know, a few months or even a few years. It's a long-term goal. And then we have the World Health Organization, which has absolutely nothing at all to do with health. In fact, it should probably be called the World Fitness Organization. The reason being is there is absolutely no money in health. Well, there's a shitload of money in fitness. <laughs> and I'll give you an example of how that's uh, crept up on us in Europe, and particularly crept up on the complementary and alternative health industry. So we have the World Bank, the head of the World Trade and World Health Organization, pursuing their extremely pernicious global agenda, which does not have the interests of humanity at heart, it has the interests of the corporate globalists. I shall show you in a second. And the driving force behind it is none other than Peter Sutherland. Peter Sutherland. And in the second half of the evening, we're going to look a lot more at this guy and how central this guy is to the web of everything that's unfolding. And in my opinion, why he was so determined to make sure that Ireland was at the forefront of the total annihilation of the sovereign nation because he wants to prove his commitment to the globalist agenda. So you know, there was no suggestion that he was biased towards everybody else and trying to protect his home country. He wanted to show that he was so totally committed to the global agenda that his home country would be one of the first to disappear into the meltdown and the bankruptcy. The agenda that we are talking about of uh, fitness is driven by an organisation called the Codex Alimentarius Commission, which has been around for 50 years now. Codex Alimentarius means Global Food Code. But if they, if they call it the Global Food Code Commission, then people might actually you know, take an interest in what they were doing and realise you know, what was going on. But by calling it Codex Alimentarius, it just goes, what's that? The Codex Alimentarius Commission is on a mission to destroy all natural farming and to completely eradicate the complementary and alternative healthcare industry. Natural farming, because the corporations want to control the biotech industry through GM crops. The reason they need GM is because you can't patent something that's natural. But once you can synthesize it, you can patent it. And what we see is this outrageous GM agenda. Let me tell you, in 1980, there wasn't a single acre of genetically modified crops grown anywhere in the world. Anything that was grown was simply in a, in, a, in a laboratory. Last year, last year, the figure, the official figure, is 331 million acres are dedicated to GM crops. In the US, the National Farming Association has given up trying to fight to retain organic animal feed. Because in the US, all the alfalfa crop, which is obviously the prime source of animal feed, all the alfalfa crop in the US is GM contaminated. In Iraq, in 2005, 
Paul Bremner, who was the first US ambassador to Iraq, the last thing he did before getting on the plane at the end of his term in office was he foisted upon the fledgling Iraqi puppet Iraqi government, he foisted upon them the new Iraqi constitution. This Iraqi constitution hadn't been written by an Iraqi, it hadn't even been seen by an Iraqi at that point, but it was given to them and it had been written by US and British civics professors. Now I'm not going to go through the whole of this constitution with you, but I'm just going to mention one element of it. Article 81, or Order 81. Order 81 in the Iraqi constitution specifically prohibits Iraqi farmers from saving their seeds. So here we have the, the cradle of civilization, the area on the planet where all the ancient texts tell us that this is where humanity was taught the art of arable and farming husbandry, and now they are no longer able to keep their seed. They have to buy their seed from a company known as Monsanto. Yeah, you got good. Monsanto. Monsanto. You might hear that name come up. Monsanto owns ninety percent of all GM biotech industry on the planet. Something like Carbion and about eight percent, and then the other two percent split up between you know, some other small players. That's just so that Monsanto can't be accused of having a monopoly. You see how it works? Mm. Yeah? At the moment that they want a monopoly, they go from 90 to 100 and a half. Anyway, has these, they wonder yeah, but how can they enforce this? Ever heard of a company called Shea? Yeah. Okay, one. Well, that, that's, and you're actually about the second <laughs> element of the whole tour. <laughs> how do you spell it? Uh, XC. Very good, very good. Yeah, yeah. Can I say more? Yeah, yeah but it's that one. Oh, he's a uh, yeah. yeah. oh, right. he's been arrested. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Now, what happened is Monsanto wanted to enter into an agreement with Blackwater to please this for them. But you see, Blackwater had a bit of bad press because some of their offices were a bit trigger happy and there was a bit of collateral damage and a few women and kids got killed. So, what they decided was that Blackwater needed to go for a makeover. So they've got an American PR company, they pay them a shed load of money to come up with a name that could not be directed into Blackwater. So they came up with Shay, spelled it XE, so that even if you hear the name Shay, you never think of spelling it XE. And there's no point in Googling XE, because if you Google XE, it's a currency exchange website. So what they've done is deliberately, it's called cool obfuscation. So what they do is they deliberately create a, a, an almost impossible trail. So that only the most ardent researchers can actually come up with a link. So now Monsanto has a contract with Shea, and Shea's role in Iraq is to police the Iraqi farmers and make sure they don't save their seed. And of course, unlike most other companies, you know, if you get a bad product from most companies, then you either get your money back or you get a replacement. Not with Monsanto. If the seeds don't germinate, and of course you have to buy a, he a whole bunch of herbicides and pesticides and other stuff to make the seeds germinate anyway, so it doesn't stop them just buying the seeds. But if they don't germinate and they don't produce any yield, it's just like tough shit. You're going to have to get some more. And of course, because they haven't got any money from the crops from the previous year because they didn't yield, then they have to borrow the money to get them. Now there's a history with this because if you actually look at the Indian cotton farmers, the BT cotton farmers in India, Monsanto has been pushing BT cotton onto the Indian farmers for 16 years now. And the same deal. If the seeds don't yield, then you have, there's no allowance, you just have to borrow more money to buy the seed. Well, some of the Indian farmers over the years have got themselves in such massive debt, they can't see any way out of it, so they commit suicide. Now, I was giving this presentation some time ago in London, and uh, I made the observation, I said 10,000 million farmers are committing suicide because of Monsanto's aggressive policy on BT cotton. And the lady stood up at the back and she said, here, 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 I have to correct you. It is not 10,000 of farmers, it is hundreds of thousands of farmers. And that was the lady who I later discovered was uh, a lady called Ben Ramashima, who's um, a very uh, um, significant campaigner on the subject in India. And then, a few weeks ago, I came across a report that was produced by a New York University, which, looking specifically at this BT cotton issue, 
And in this report, it states that one Indian cotton farmer commits suicide every 30 minutes. So you, we start to see that this globalization agenda does not in any way, shape, or form have any of the interests of humanity at heart. It is a callous, pernicious agenda. And if they're in collateral, then, well, that's just the way it is. I mean, this is Malthusian, it's the, sort of the Darwinian philosophy, survival of you know, those who can keep paying money and tough for those who can't. When it comes to health, the Internet Alimentary Commission tried to initially attack the complementary alternative health care industry in the UN. But people realised what was happening and they fought against it. And in um, 1994, a piece of legislation was introduced called the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act, which put a reset around the complementary uh, and alternative health community in America, so they turned their attention to Europe. So, four or five years ago, I started talking about this subject, and I think it's a bit area. And in 2007, I recorded a presentation, a presentation called the UN Agenda to Eradicate Against Farming and to Destroy the Natural Health Industry. And this was being discussed on a number of complementary and alternative health forums on the web. And people from the Conference on Alternative Health Care Industry were asking questions, saying, you know, is this, is this for real? And people were coming on these forums saying, oh, no, no, don't want to to anything in the that teaches the conspiracy theory. Let me tell you that it is my supposition that every one of those people posting those kind of comments was bought and paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. Because if they weren't, then they were actually, one could argue, failing their shareholders. They knew they could see the checkers back. They could see the end of complementary medicine in Europe. And of course, this would mean a massive, massive payday for the pharmaceutical industry. And as of well, the 1st of May this year, all complementary and alternative natural medicine became illegal. No, 1st of May. 1st of May. 1st of May. This year. This year. They became illegal. Now, when I recorded this presentation, I said it would take between five and seven years for them to achieve this. I was wrong, because they did it in less than four. And the complementary and alternative health practitioners, unfortunately, contributed to this because they did nothing. They did absolutely nothing. Because they were led to believe that it really wouldn't happen. But now it's too late. Now, I will have, I have to tell you that the lady who's speaking in Cork in a few weeks, this is Mr. Lafferton, Kathy Simmons, she actually was one of the only campaigners in the European Parliament, she's former MP, and she was one of the only campaigners in the European Parliament to try to stop this legislation coming forth. So she was not hiding nothing. A hiding is absolutely nothing. Now, the manufacturers of the natural product had to get approval. Because with the signing of the Treaty of Lisbon, it completely changed the way in Ireland and the UK our laws worked. Prior to the ratification of the Treaty of Lisbon, the UK and Ireland operated under common law. Now on a personal level, common law means that you are innocent of anything you are accused of until you are proven beyond any reasonable doubt to be guilty. Napoleonic law, which is now in force throughout the EU, is completely opposite. Napoleonic law means that you are guilty of anything you are accused of until you have proven yourself to be innocent. From a product point of view, under common law, under common law, anything is legal. Everything is legal until it is specifically banned. I mean, a classic example of that would be LSE, for example, which was legal up until 1967 because there was nothing to ban it. And then the legislation in 67 was introduced to make it illegal. Now it's completely the other way around. If you want to sell a product, you have to go and seek approval. And to get your product approved, it's probably going to cost you around about 80 to 100,000 euros. So consequently, the small companies just couldn't afford to do it and they just decided not to bother. So right now, we in, we in Europe have a situation where all Chinese herbal medicines are illegal. 
All Ayurvedic medicines are legal, all Amazonian medicines are illegal in Europe. And the pharmaceutical industry goes, thank you. See how it works. I'll take questions later. You see how it works. Yeah? And the natural health companies had their biggest payday ever over the last quarter because those people knew what was going on, of course, were stocking up with you know, a lifetime supply of the uh, natural products they needed. Now what you see on the shelves of the health food stores, and you can go look for this, you'll see in the big letters it says St. John's Wood. And then underneath it says equivalent. Anytime you see the word equivalent, what you are looking at is a synthesized product that has been patented by the pharmaceutical industry. And that's how they have effectively managed to increase their market share dramatically, effectively, overnight. Now, let's go back to the economy. We're coming towards the end of the first half of the evening here, and then we'll take a 20 minute break so you can recharge your glasses or whatever. Let's take a look at the economy. And in the second half of the evening, we're going to focus very much on what's going on right here in Ireland with the economy and the assets that are being provided to the Now, I could go into great detail explaining how the web of European debt has really created this massive black hole. But I came across this superb sketch. It's from an Australian, it's from an Australian economics program, and it was recorded back in October of last year. Now in this sketch, these guys are comedians by the way, but it's an economics program. And in this sketch, it's a spoof round of mastermind, and the questions being asked are on the European economy. And I want you to listen very, very carefully for the number mentioned for Ireland, because this is very, very significant. I'm now the John Clark and Brian Doyle with a few, few reflections on Europe's financial woes. Your name is Roger, yes? Roger. Ah, that's your name. Roger. Good. And what are you doing, Roger? I'm a financial consultant. Ah, financial consultant. Right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what's your house business? Not bad, thank you. Uh, I'm Benjamin Squire, thank you. How do you mean, maybe? Since the war, Benjamin Squire. Fair enough. Okay, well, there's still a special subject tonight in the economy of the European community. It's hard to say that now. Thanks for the last review. How much does money owe, Roger? Uh, 367 billion euros. Okay, well, that's not bad. And look at that other two. Yeah, Mostly through the other European economy. Correct. How much does Ireland owe? 865 billion. Correct. And who do they owe it to? Other European economies, maybe. Correct. How much does Spain and Italy owe? One trillion dollars each. Correct. Who do? Mainly in France, Britain, and Germany. Correct. And how much revenue is France and Britain going, Roger? Well, they're struggling with it, aren't they? Correct. Because they've made all these. But and as money to other European economies that can't possibly pay them back. Correct. So what are they going to do? They're going to buy them out. Correct. Where are they getting the money to do that, Roger? Who can do the question? I have nothing answer to that one. How much does Portugal owe? Hang on a minute. Well, what's the answer to the question? Just keep answering the question. <laughs> Where is Portugal going to get the money it owes to Germany if Germany can't get back the money that it went to England? Just a minute. What was the answer to the previous question? The question was, how can broke economy lend money to other broke economies who haven't got any money because they can't pay back the money the broke economy lends to the other broke economy and shouldn't have lent them in the first place because the broke economy can't pay it back? You're working very well in time, Roger. How much money does Spain owe to the world? $41 billion, but where are we going to get it? Correct. What does Italy owe to Spain? $27 billion. But they have got the broke. Correct. How can they pay each other with neither of them who have any money? They can make it a buyout, aren't they? Correct. And where's the money coming from for the bank? Well, that's what I'm asking you. Correct. Because the European currency is buying the US dollar. Because the US economy is so much stronger than the European economy. Correct. Why is that, Roger? Because it's owned by China. Correct. And after that round, you lost a million dollars. I lost a million dollars. It's well done. It's well done. You only lost a million dollars. 
Unfortunately, both of those roundings are in the wrong direction because the debt has to get bigger. If we carry on down this existing path, the debt has to get bigger and the population will get smaller because of the emigration that will inevitably follow. But for the purpose of the illustration, a one trillion dollar debt and a population of five million people. What that means is that any person born into the Irish economy in 2011 is born with a future debt, a tax debt of 200,000 euros, just to pay for the excesses of the last 13 years. So that's what, that's basically what we are condemning future generations to if we do nothing. We are condemning the future generations to lie in literally of abject economic slavery because that's the debt liability that's been incurred by this outrageous strategy. And once again, it's not a lie to say that the bailout is 85. It's not a lie to say that they need another 24. But of course, it's not exactly sharing the whole truth. It's not sharing the truth that uh, the real debt is over a trillion. There are individuals who have been trying to tell people what's been going on. Morgan Kelly. Anybody know Morgan Kelly? A brilliant economist based at the University College of Dublin. He doesn't write very many articles in the media. He actually doesn't write very many academic papers either. But when he does write, he is absolutely on the money. And he's been trying to raise awareness of the magnitude of this pending disaster for at least the last three years. And every time an article appears from Morgan Kelly, he is absolutely spot on. In fact, Jim and I, when we were doing a tour, the Meltdown tour last uh, November, December, you know, we were joking that you know, he had to be coming along to our, our presentations because he was writing in the Irish Times and the Irish Independent, and it was pretty much you know, a summary of what we were presenting in that talk. Now, I don't believe one moment he was coming along to the talk because you know, we just basically reading the same script and we could see how this was going to unfold. Now you know that Morgan Kelly was starting to um, uh, challenge the agenda, and he was starting to ruffle the feathers of those driving the agenda because this is from the Irish Independent a couple of weeks ago. Just how smart he's got to do. And this is the demonization of Morgan Kelly. What he's trying to do is to convince the majority of the Irish public, don't read this guy, he's just a nutter. This is the guy you should be reading because this is the guy, you know, the baby, how and then and should have been asking to uh, give them some advice and guidance as to how they might get out of this mess. But as we'll see, unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, they were way out of their debt. Way, way, way out of their debt. 17 years ago, at the meeting of the UN Economic Committee, which was effectively the first formal meeting of the World Trade Organization after it had been established in 1994, the Director General of course being Peter Sullivan. At that meeting, David Rockefeller made a speech, and in that speech he said, we are on the verge of global transformation. All we need is the right range of crisis, and the nation will accept the new world order. The new world order, of course, being the global corporation, the global board of directors, where each entity around the world is simply a division of that corporation and national sovereignty was consigned to the dustbin of history. In the second half of the evening, we're going to look at how Ireland should and could be the wealthiest nation in Western Europe, and that's without even touching the hydrocarbon resources. And I'm going to explain to you why I think there is an agenda right now to try and mislead the people into thinking that the only way out of this is to uh, extract the hydrocarbon, bring in the oil and gas corporations, extract the hydrocarbon, because I've seen this agenda work elsewhere. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. So let's take a break, and let's be back here for uh, absolutely no